Welcome everyone to the first Pinedo Brothers podcast. I'm James Pinedo. And I'm Peter Pinedo. And we're filmmaking brothers living and working in Los Angeles that have decided to start this podcast to talk about what we work, talk about our work and what inspires us. Um, we're working to revitalize the world of Catholic art and uh, this podcast is just uh, devious enough for us to try, or we're just devious enough to try to do this podcast broadcasting live on YouTube. We'll see how long. I'm switching as I'm talking. So, for example, if Peter says something, Banana Brothers Podcast, <laughs> episode one. I might not switch fast enough back or vice versa. Like right now, I didn't switch back fast enough, but you guys would be generous with us. Hopefully, we'll, uh, we'll get the hang of it quicker rather than later or slower. Um, so this episode, we're talking about, um, well, you know, before we start talking about this episode, maybe it'd be good to say a little bit about ourselves. Mm -hmm. Peter, tell us, tell the good people about yourself. Well, you already know my name. I'm Peter. I just recently graduated from Franciscan University of Steubenville, uh, way out and over in Ohio. I'm from Houston, Texas, but I'm out here in LA now, living the good California life. So I'm a traveler, as you can tell. I've been all over the place. Um, love to be constantly on the move. Uh, I just wrote the book, The Unfollowed, right here, which we'll be talking about a little bit and about what inspired it. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit about me. Um, do you want to say something? Sure. So my name's James Pinello. I am the older and fatter of the two brothers. <laughs> A little more bald, a little more fat, uh, but a little bit more uh, years behind under the belt as well. And I am the director of the um, movie The Extrovert, which you may see have seen streaming on uh, Amazon right now. And we are, um, you know, what we are setting out, Peter and I, to do is to make a faith-based film for the Christian that is tired of faith-based films and make a film that talks about faith for a non-Christian to be able to watch. It's, when we're talking about, uh, and that's what we try to do the, with The Unfollowed, and that's what Peter did, uh, that's what Peter did in The Unfollowed, that's what we try to do in The Extrovert as well. Um, and what we are hoping to do, when we say revitalize the world of Catholic art, we're talking about how in, in the olden times, you know, Peter, for example, we when I say olden, like back in the 1500s or the 1600s, mm -hmm. there wasn't, when people thought of Catholic art, they thought of what was the best, what is best out there. Mm -hmm. These days, when people think of Catholic art, I guess, I don't know what people think of, like, the, I, I, I'm drawing a blank. There's the passion. Is that the only Catholic art that's out there? Maybe. Yeah, yeah. I think um, something that's very important to both of us is that um, we as Catholics have this great heritage of very strong imagery and very powerful um, artistic content that in today and 2020 is not very present to uh, in the Catholic world at all. So. That's something that's very important from when we acknowledge that it, it existed at a, t at a certain point in time and we're trying to bring it back. So that's what we mean. So what do you think happened to it? Where did it go? Why, why are we no longer the leaders in art at this point? Uh, I, I know that there are good artists out there that are Catholic. Mel Gibson is an example. Uh, Mark Wahlberg is also a Catholic, you know, but when you think of Catholic art, you don't think of the Sistine Chapel anymore. As, as far as when we're making a, talking about a movie, when we're writing a book, when we're mm -hmm. talking about music, we think of Catholic art and we draw a blank. What happened to it? Where did it go? So I think, I, can't, I couldn't really say for sure, but I think part of it is that um, I think today, especially in the United States, Catholics kind of have the this tendency to marginalize their faith or put it into one part of their life like oh I go to church and I go to mass on Sundays or even weekdays but I'm not gonna 
that that my faith doesn't really inspire or seep into the rest of my life and what I do. And I think when you look at medieval artistic work or something from the Renaissance, you see that their faith is what is um, kind of in every aspect of their life and really uh, the way they think and what they're uh, seen as artists, how they see the world as artists is also how they see it as people of faith. And um, so I think in modern tendency is to not, is to kind of just put faith as something that's just, you know, one part of you instead of something that encompasses your entire mind. It's kind of, it's, an, it's a thought I have. So I don't know what you think about it. Hmm. So you're saying that we don't, we don't, when we, we compartmentalize ourselves, we compartmentalize mm -hmm. our faith and we compartmentalize what we create and make them two separate things and you think that's kind of the problem? Yeah, I think that that's at least part of the problem in that Catholics today oftentimes have that tendency to not let it seep into every aspect of their life and to, especially when it comes to art, it's, um, it's kind of separated somehow from the artistic life, which doesn't really make sense because if just looking back, you can see the great examples of what the faith has inspired in the world. It's, I mean, it's still visible, but it's definitely from other times, not so much from, from modern times, wouldn't you say? Hmm. Yeah, I could see that. I could see that. I think, I think that the church, I think there is that problem, but there's also a big problem with the church was seen as a purveyor of art. The church was seen as something that, uh, like, okay, we're going to support artists to go out and make a mass, make a requiem, make something that is uh, like the Sistine Chapel. Mm -hmm. And I think the fact that we put that priority onto it as a church, it led itself for artists to create Catholic art. And I'm not saying that church should sponsor should sponsor uh, Catholic artists, but I think Catholics should sponsor Catholic artists mm -hmm. um, because we make up the church. But I could see, yeah, it is it is a multi fast as as Jordan Peterson would say, it's it's a multivariate equation. There's not one answer. Mm -hmm. But what you've done with your book, The Unfollowed, available um, on Amazon, Amazon. Mm -hmm. Amazon right now, is you didn't allow that separation to exist. You are very influenced quite a bit by many, many things that come from your faith, and one of them is the Book of Tobit. Mm -hmm. So let me see, I'm gonna pull up here. Tobit chapter five, verse four through seven. And we'll just read it, and then we can talk a little bit about it. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite books, by the way. I'm so glad that you wanted to, to talk about Tobit. Okay. Tobiah went to look for someone acquainted with the roads who would travel with him to Media. As soon as he went out, he found the angel Raphael standing before him, though he did not know that this was an angel of God. Tobiah said to him, Who are you, young man? He replied, I am an Israelite, one of your kinsmen. I have come here to work. Tobiah said, Do you know the way to Media? The other replied, yes, I have been there many times. I know the place well, and I know all the routes. I have often traveled to Media. I used to stay with your kinsman, Gabayo, who lives in Rajas, in Media. It is a good two days travel from Ekbaktana to Rajas, for Rajas is situated in the mountains, Ekbaktana, out on the plateau. Tobias said to him, wait for me, young man. I will go and tell my father, for I need you to make the journey with me. I will, of course, pay you. Raphael replied, very well, I will wait for you, but do not be long. Tobiah went to tell his father Tobit what had happened. He said to him, I have just found a, a man who is one of our own Israelite kinsmen. Tobit said, call the man so that I may find out what family and tribe he comes from and whether he is trustworthy enough to travel with you, son. Tobiah went to summon the man, saying, young man, my father would like to see you. When Raphael entered the house, Tobit greeted him first. Raphael said, hearty greetings to you. Tobit replied, what joy is left for me anymore? Here I am, a blind man who cannot see God's sunlight, but must remain in darkness, like the dead who no longer see the light. Though alive, I am among the dead. I can hear a man's voice, but I cannot see him. Raphael said, take courage. 
God has healing in store for you, so take courage. Tobit then said, My son Tobiah wants to go to Media. Can you go with him to show him the way? I will, of course, pay you, brother. Raphael answered, Yes, I can go with him, for I know all the routes. I have often traveled to Media and crossed all its plains and mountains, so I know every road well. Tobit asked, Brother, tell me, please, what family and tribe are you from? Raphael said, Why? Do you need a tribe and a family? Or are you looking for a hired man to travel with your son? Tilbert replied, I wish to know truthfully whose son you are, brother, and what your name is. Raphael answered, I am Azariah, son of Hananiah the Elder, one of your own kinsmen. Tilbert exclaimed, Welcome. God save you, brother. Do not be provoked with me, brother, for wanting to learn the truth about your family. So it turns out that you are a kinsman and from a noble and good line. I knew Hananiah and Nathaniah, the two sons of Shemaiah, the elder. With me, they used to make the pilgrimage to Jerusalem, where we would worship together. No, they did not stray from the right path. Your kinsmen are good men. You are certainly of good lineage and welcome. Then he added, for each day you are away, I will give you the normal wages, plus expenses for you and my son. If you go with my son, I will even add a bonus to your wages. Raphael replied, I will go with him. Have no fear. In good health, we shall leave you, and in good health, we shall return to you, for the way is safe. Tobit said, God bless you, brother. Then he called his son and said to him, My son, prepare whatever you need for your journey, and set out with your kinsmen. May God in heaven protect you on the way, and bring you back to me safe and sound. And may his angel accompany you for your safety my son. That's Tobit chapter 5, verse 4 through 17. Mm -hmm. And so now I think uh, we're going to read a couple of pages from the unfollowed that mm -hmm. might uh, connect the two. Take it away, Pete. All right. So just to give you a little excerpt from the unfollowed, um, I'll read a couple of pages. Here we go. Father Michael went on to say that Tobias needed prayer and that most of all he needed love, which the father said would come in the form of more prayer. Later the father took me aside and charged me in the name of the saints to look after Tobias. You may not have known him all that well before, but now that the world has taken a turn, your paths have merged. He looked me dead in the eye. Raphael, life is a journey. We are all of us on a perilous road. Our paths lead us to heaven or, paths lead us to heaven or hell. It is not a coincidence that you have both survived and both ended up here. You two must help each other. Find the right paths. To s so stay with him, Raphael. If ever you had any love for the girl who was his sister, stay with him. Protect him from harm if you can, but most importantly, strive to protect his soul. I stared at the priest, still pretty bewildered by everything that had just taken place. I don't think you really know what you're ask who you're asking, Father, I answered at length. I've never been what you would call devout. He just smiled. You're the man for the job. What makes you say that? I asked, him, looking at him quizzically. I know people, and I know this is what you must do, he answered simply. I'll do what I can, I said, shrugging, and God will do the rest. No disrespect, but I thought God was supposed to be your area of expertise, not people. Well, people were made by God, his eyes bored into me. You might say I know God best by knowing people. That way I know him by knowing his greatest creations. Father, I mused aloud, my eyes subconsciously tracing the designs on the wall. I was Catholic, but how can you keep all this up after everything that's happened? After what's happened exactly, he asked. Involuntarily, I scoffed. It was such a ridiculous question. I studied his face. Judging by his expression, he was actually serious. After the world went to hell, I snapped at him. After these, these creatures appeared and destroyed everything. After all that, how can we dare speak of, good, of a good God or things like religion? And besides, who has the time? He laughed a simple, carefree laugh. If the world has ended as you say, then we have nothing but time. From my point of view, nothing has changed. Before the darkness fell, before those creatures came, people lived, suffered, and died. Today, they continue to do so. My job hasn't changed. We all live, suffer, and die. That's the way this works. My job is to help people get to heaven as they go about those three activities. The battlefield may have changed, but the mission stays the same. The battlefield, I repeated under my breath. Yeah, so there's a bit of it. Wow, and just for the folks that don't know, The Unfollowed is a story about basically the zombie apocalypse mm -hmm. and how a young man is 
Well, what's what's the young man's mission? So yeah, the the idea for the unfollowed came was inspired by a lot of different things. Obviously, one of them is the book of Tobit that we're talking about today. Um, but one of the main ideas of the book was to write a zombie novel um, come from a different perspective than you normally get because there's a lot of zombie stories out there obviously of varying degrees of quality but this one is kind of meant to be one to make you think and the idea of, of it is that the main character Raphael um, who was just speaking there to another character um, is he's on a mission to go and save this, the girl that he loves basically but the only thing is that he is infected and he is slowly turning himself into one of the zombies yeah the thing that's different about this story which I love but I'm biased but I love it is um, that you have people that turn into zombies at very varying degrees and, and they're also sentient as they're becoming a zombie and there's moments when they you're not a zombie when you be, when, and then you you are one and you go back. It, it's it's a very, it, it it's it's different for every person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was kind of a big thing for me because I I'm obviously a huge fan of the zombie genre, but I think for a lot of them, a lot of stories just kind of make it much more clear cut than I think it would be in real life, because I think that if something like the zombie apocalypse were to actually happen, then there would be differences. It wouldn't be a, the exact same virus for every single person that gets it because people are different and there's different uh, circumstances and environments and stuff and so it's going to affect people in different ways. And so, and in my mind, that kind of makes it a more scary virus because let's say it's something like The Walking Dead. You get infected, you know, you're going to turn right away. So, you know, the best thing is just, oh, someone, I need to get killed. I'm something, you know, I need to end this. But in this story, it's not that clear cut. You get infected, you might turn. You might turn tomorrow, but you might also turn in two years. You know, it's 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 more of a mind game that way. Yeah. Well, speaking of mind games, the connection between Tobit and the Unfollowed, mm -hmm. especially as regards to these uh, these two passages that we read. The first connection that I see is both of them are both the writer of the book of Tobit and you attach and actually not just the writer but the actual person of Tobit and attaches a huge significance to a name the meaning of a name mm -hmm. I just want to like uh, say maybe our people that are watching might uh, might not be familiar Azariah the name that um, that angel Raphael takes that that means in Hebrew Yahweh helps and Hananiah his father means Yahweh is merciful so he's the son of mercy basically the son of that mm -hmm. and Shemaiah his kinsman means Yahweh hears so Raphael is in line he's saying truth in the name in each name that he gives and the same with uh, so, so that is a, one of the signifiers to show that how much uh, importance he attaches to a name. Mm -hmm. And the same thing happens with uh, the father in your story, where he says, in the name of the saints, I adjure you to, to go, or not adjure, I'm, I'm, I'm putting my own language on it, but mm -hmm. in the name of the saints, he asked Raphael to go with Tobias. And then the fact that you call him Raphael, and the mm -hmm. fact that you call him Tobias, show a lot deep significance that you have in a name. I attach the same thing when I'm talking about in my stories. Like, okay, when I when when I'm talking about uh, Thomas in the extrovert, the name Thomas has a deep significance. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I'm also thinking a lot about names because I've got a baby on the way, and so I'm thinking, okay, what is the name? Thank you. <laughs> What is the name uh, when I, that I give, that we give, to this child? What what does that significance have? Um, and another thing, I don't, I don't want to bounce this off to you soon, but when you think about it, um, he, to, uh, Raphael seems, in the book of Tobit, Raphael, the angel Raphael seems hesitant to give his name 
almost as if that is re revealing too much that he might not be ready for. Mm. Um, if you remember in Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring, the are actually throughout, it's a through line, people are hesitant to give their name. Mm -hmm. They don't, they, it, it's a dangerous thing. Like Aragorn, when he gives his name to Eomar, um, and when the right in the writers of Rohan are, are riding past, it was a sign. I trust you. I'm just, I'm lowering my defenses. That's it's a very vulnerable thing to give a name, mm -hmm. because it reveals so much about who we are. Um, C.S. Lewis talks a lot about this as well. But what was kind of inspiring you when you chose that name, Raphael? Can you tell me more? So is it just because he? It, of the book of Tobit, or can you tell me more about that name? Yeah, um, so kind of a, a common theme throughout the book um, is this idea of, and it's brought in the, in the excerpt that we read, it's brought out a little bit, um, this idea of there being two realities um, in, in the book, and also I believe that in real life there's two realities, there's the physical and there's the spiritual. Um, and so I think that the characters Raphael and Tobias, while they're going out on this physical journey to go find, um, to go find the girl that he loves, they're also embarking on a spiritual journey that's fraught with its own spiritual dangers and, uh, traps. Um, and so the character Tobias is someone who is a little bit kind of a little bit further behind in his spiritual journey, I would say, than Raphael. Neither of them are perfect, and, and Raphael, in my story, is definitely not an angel. He's a human being with his own shortcomings. Um, but the idea is that they are going on this journey, um, a spiritual journey as well, that they are going to help each other achieve their own salvation. Um, and the idea is that Tobias needs... Raphael to help him along that journey to help him find his spiritual salvation so yeah um, the names there are, are very important um, definitely and I think you're right definitely names have this significance they have this deeper meaning um, that is is very real to us uh, people who believe in these two types of realities and I find that idea talking about the two types of realities fascinating. I, I, I loved how you used the word battlefield uh, when you're talking about life as a battlefield. That's something that a lot of Catholics are kind of afraid to use. Can you tell me a little bit more about what made you choose that very inflammatory language, mm -hmm. which I love? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> there is a little bit of a tendency to move away uh, from that language of a battlefield but I think as Catholics it's been long been held as this idea that we on earth here uh, still in the physical world are part of the church militant we are on a mission to combat um, the powers of evil here in the world um, and that's kind of our commissioning as, as followers of Christ is that we are soldiers and I think um, more than anyone else in the book, uh, Father Michael is definitely aware. He's very in tune with this, this spiritual warfare that's going on in, in the story. Um, he knows that his ultimate mission is not to bring people comfort in this life, although he, he does try to build a community for them to help them be safe. But his ultimate goal is to help people achieve their salvation. Um, and that is his mission, that's his battle. Um, so, kind of, the character Raphael, he, um, all he sees at this point in the story, and he, he has his own arc, um, where he realizes there's more, but all he sees now is that, oh, society has fallen apart, everything, you know, I've lost everything. Um, how can, how can there be, how can we talk about a good God? Um, but, to Father Michael, he's you know basically just having a normal day because he nothing has changed for him. He's still on the same mission. The fact that society has fallen apart actually doesn't really have any bearing on his mission at all. Um, 
What was the question again? Wow, but hang on, hang on, hang on. Before, I, I forget the question. Uh, what I want to know is, so what we're talking about now is, well, that, that begs the question, we're in the middle of a pandemic right now. Mm -hmm. Like, we can't go outside our door without wearing a mask. Mm -hmm. By law, at least. <laughs> we cannot do a lot of things by law, though. That, anyway. Um, <laughs> this is being recorded, so. The NSA is listening. <laughs> let's see how long we get shut down by <laughs> Fed Google as well. Um, any case, the... Um, we're in the middle of a pandemic. When it hit, when the church is closed, when I couldn't go out for work, when all like it seemed like every the, all these things work, play, faith, religion well not faith, but practice of religion, the outward practice of it, was all stripped away. For me it was very disruptive. You know, I'm all on board with there's a uh, two realities. I get that. And I, I think it's a shame that we no longer use Catholic militant, and we no longer use our church militant, church triumphant, church penitent, which would be souls in purgatory. I think that's a shame that we don't use that, um, because it's important that we realize things are going to be hard, and that there is a path that we're on, mm -hmm. you know, that, and that the devil is real, and that he's out to get us. The fact that the priests don't say that in the pulpit most of the time is a disservice to us. They are in the pews now. Maybe they're scared that those that are in the pews will get offended and want to, and then want to come to church, which then is the fault of the people in the pews for not not being tough enough, however, or not wanting real teaching. However, to say that for for a father to say like, or for you to say that the father's mentality is, well, it's just another day at the office. Mm -hmm. That's kind of radical, right there, because everything is different. You know, how, how do you how do you manage to tell me more about this character that's able to say, oh, it's just another day at the office, because that kind of faith is something that I haven't got. Mm hmm. Yeah, no, he like he said, the, the battlefield has changed. The mission stays the same. Um, so obviously he acknowledges that there are differences, um, but that doesn't change, you know, what he's out there to do. And um, there's these people like Raphael who happened upon his community and he recognizes that his job as a priest is still to get him to achieve his, sal his salvation. Um, yeah, and so this, this idea that is in his head, this I am part of the church militant is something that, I mean, obviously a lot of people here in, in the real world uh, struggle with and um, but I think that he realizes I'm a leader in this fight, in this in this struggle, um, and I can't back down from that, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's very important to him. Um, yeah, yeah. You read in the book if you if you ever get a chance to to buy it on Amazon and check it out, you'll see that he is he's completely en enveloped in that idea of I'm here to be Christ to these people. And the, his, his arc kind of climaxes when he's, the imagery is very much that he is becoming Christ to Raphael. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Well, makes me want to read it again. But I think we're about running out of time. Uh, we had more points to get through, but mm, we, short. we promised that we would cut it off at 30 minutes. So we'll uh, emphasize the amount of whiskey. So that's about time. But I'm James Pinello, and this is my brother Peter. We're filmmaking brothers out to revitalize the world of Catholic art. Um, I hope you enjoyed ta uh, being with us for this half hour as we talked about what inspired the art that we've created. Uh, we'll come up with another thing to talk about next week, another piece of, uh, of the puzzle that, we've, that we're constructing currently. Mm -hmm. But uh, I hope you all join us and... It'll only get smoother and better from here. We'll have smoother whiskey next time. Maybe. We did it. <laughs> All right. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week.